Hi, welcome to this technology overview for flow wedging within Bifrost for Maya. So what is flow wedging? Flow wedging is basically taking the simulations from your machine and sending them to uh, a cloud service to be cached um, and sent back to you so that you don't have to do this intensive process within your own machine. As we know, Caching on your own machine takes a lot of time and resources um, and in some instances it stops us from being able to actually use a machine while we're caching. So with flow wedging we can send that entire service off to the Autodesk cloud caching service um, and then receive our cached files back again uh, quite often quicker than we can do it on our local machines. So we can send uh, .bob files, alembics, and VDBs. So we can use that for combustion or fluids, um, any kind of granular simulation, uh, particle simulation, anything that needs a VDB, a .bob file, or um, an alembic sent back. And it actually comes back in real time as it is cached on the cloud so it will be downloading back to your machine so make sure you've got enough space on your machine um, and showing up within Bifrost um, and what we can also do is actually create more than one version so what do I mean by that well we can specify using a flow wedge parameter node um, different attributes that we want to change so let's say we want to change the expansion scale on a combustion simulation um, and we want to have a really small expansion scale and we want to have a very large expansion scale. So we can actually specify up to four uh, variations of that and send them off to the cloud and the cloud will be taking care of that and sending it back to us. And then we can be looking through that um, to see what's working for us. And then that gives us an idea of kind of what direction we want to be traveling down. It's actually amazing. Um, and I've been using it a lot lately. Um, so yeah, let's get to it and take a look at flow wedging. So here's my scene. What I'm doing in this scene, if we just quickly look at uh, a result, um, and that is for this ship to kind of land and we're getting like a, a blow up of dust and stuff like that that's just uh, occurring underneath this sort of fan that's going on um, to do that i've just created a plane underneath this piece of simple geometry um, that's emitting a fluid and it's got a very low temperature to it it's uh, set to one i've also got a fractal noise field plugged into the fog density that's just sort of breaking up the shape somewhat and then the way that it's sort of swirling around is because of a collider that I've got parented to the fan that's underneath here, which is running through this collider node here. And we've got an inherent velocity set up of three, which is just allowing us to kind of start to spin that uh, fluid around. Then got an Aero Einstein influence node, which is just sort of uh, giving us some extra shape and noise and in my solver settings there's nothing especially exciting going on there apart from i've got a low buoyancy just to keep help keep that fluid from uh, not raising too high um, and that's about it really so the problem i've got at the moment is that if i want to start looking at this simulation um, i need to be play blasting or caching or trying to play it on my own machine so if i hit play now it's not like particularly slow, it's not the worst, but I'm not at a very high resolution at the moment, so I don't really get to see what this is looking like. I can see that it works, I can see the general shape, uh, but to dial that resolution in, I'm simply gonna have to cache or do like a long play blast overnight or something like that. And that's where flow wedging and the flow graph engine come in to this and just kind of really make our life a lot easier. This has kind of changed the way in which I create simulations in a, in a big way. So let's just stop that for a second. So a couple of things to look at. Firstly, you need to be using Maya 2025 and above. You need to be using 2.11 or above, depending on when you watch this. Um, and if you open up Maya and this flow graph engine isn't here, you just want to go into Windows Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager. Scroll down to the Bifrost section, which is here, and just make sure that this flow wedging.py is loaded and set to auto load. And then you should have this show up in your uh, main menu set along here. So the first thing you want to do is hit the tab key and start typing wedge. 
and then we can select a wedge parameter. Now wedge parameter is gonna enable us to change some of the settings on our uh, simulation. Um, so for instance, if I wanna change the inherent velocity that the fluid uses based on the collider, I can do that by plugging in a wedge parameter to inherent velocity. And I know that that inherent velocity was set to three, I believe. So I'm gonna have my start at two and my end at say eight. What that means is we're gonna get, when, when we create a set of three simulations to send off, we'll get three simulations back with varying attributes between inherent velocity two and inherent velocity eight. So actually let's change that to 12. It's just like really see a difference. Now you don't just have to use one wedge parameter, we could use more. If we were using combustion, we could do like temperature, or if we had a combustion solver node, we could do it on expansion scale or something like that. Initial speed, I could use that, but it's kind of not right for this uh, simulation. So let's just go control C, control V and change the temperature on this. So if I just plug that into temperature, I know that I had temperature set to one. So I was kind of happy with one, let's leave it at one. And let's do a temperature of something more buoyant. Let's go with like 300. And just see the differences. So what's gonna happen is, we're gonna send off our simulation. We're gonna ask for three wedges to be sent off. So that's gonna be three sets of 125 frames of cache files that we'll get come back. Okay, so the next thing that we have to do here is let's just start typing wedge again and we'll get a wedge cache and we'll just drop that in here to objects and then first object out. We do that before the assigned material because shading comes after caching. Um, and then we've got properties, so much like any file node, sorry, any um, file cache node, if we leave the star in there, it's gonna write absolutely everything. We don't really want that. So we're just gonna go with uh, voxel fog density. And then I'm gonna do a voxel underscore velocity. So I'm doing a velocity just for uh, motion blur as for when we come to rendering. I don't really need any temperature for the shader. So I don't really need that written. And so that's it for that. Um, we can see that it's set to read or pass through. So basically this scene is gonna go off to the cloud. It will be cached and those files, those cache files will start to automatically download back to a specified folder on our machine. And then we'll be able to start scrubbing through our timeline as those cache files come back. And if they're there, they'll be read. Um, so the next thing we have to do is deselect all nodes by clicking in this space here. And we can see that we've got this. So basically it's looking at our project directory. So we've got scene directory, cache, scene, scene, wedge, wedge index. Really important that wedge index is here because we want to be writing free wedge indexes. So I'm going to type in free here and that's going to give us a wedge count, a wedge index from zero to two. So that's free indexes. Uh, so that's done. And the next step is to actually send it off. So we just go up to the flow graph engine and we'll go to create new job. Now it's gonna be looking at different Bifrost graphs that you've got in your scene. We've only got one, so if you had more, there would be more in here. Um, this is wedges that I was just talking about just now. It's saying to only compute wedge zero, but we want to compute the free wedges that we've set in our wedge index count. So we're gonna go free. And here's where you can select the size of the compute you want. Let's just go middle of the range. And obviously going forwards, you will be allocated a certain amount of hours that you can use these machines for. So you'll make some decisions based on the timeout and the per execution. You may want to time out after an hour or 12 hours based on either how many hours of caching, like credits or whatever comes to fruition you've got left, or it may be that you want to use a timeout because you know, you've got a good idea that if you're caching over 12 hours there's something wrong um so i'm just gonna tidy up this job name uh and leave that v2 autodesk chopper blades and i'm gonna hit okay and what's gonna happen now you can see the timeline just scrub through it's just calculating what's happening in the scene and it will start uploading the files to the cloud now you can't see that that's just slightly off of screen on the bottom of my um maya tab but it's 50 percent done 75 percent done done 
and it should show up here now we can see that it's scheduled so that's now sitting on the cloud service and it's scheduled to start the next thing that will pop up is that it's computing and then after that it will say downloading very quickly so we can see already that it's saying downloading that's like a minute from when it was uploaded so if we actually click on here we can look at the uh, different wedges that are happening at once and we can see that for wedge zero we've already done seven frames nine frames so it's flying through go to wedge one that's done 12 frames wedge two and obviously based on your internet speed um, these files will start showing up in the folder so let's have a look at that so in our project folder we've got a scenes cache and we can see that we've got our Autodesk chopper blades folder we click in here we can see that we've got a VDB showing up which is great that's what we want at the moment you can see if you look at the end here this says wedge underscore zero this says wedge underscore two and uh, one sorry and this is wedge underscore two so they're all uh, caching simultaneously and um, we'll just keep a little while on this uh, for five minutes let a few download and then we'll just start scrubbing for our timeline so we can see we're up to sort of 57 frames so we'll just start looking through these frames so with the node still deselected if i rewind to the beginning and then rather than press play which could see this simulate i'll just go to like frame 25 let's just go back a bit I don't think the file exists at the moment but yeah we can see that cache is now appearing which is really cool so if we ch change to wedge index one hit enter rewind i can see that i've my um i've had more of this cache download currently uh than others so i can go to like frame 25 here hopefully and we can see that appear now this one will be kind of midway between wedge zero and wedge two, the three wedges. And so this will have like a higher temperature, hence it coming up higher and also a higher inherent velocity as well, but midway between uh, zero and two. And so if I just have a little look how wedge two is doing, we've got uh, 20 frames available. So I could just have a look at that. And so if I just click off, and type in two here and rewind how many frames is that again so 20 frames so i'll go to like frame 19 and we can see that this one um is showing up as well but also you know we we're only up to frame 20 not a lot happens up to here anyway so that's the three caches you know they're showing up and working within the scene at the moment and so let's wait for this to finish and then uh, take a look at the rest of them and I'll show another example that I've got. Also, something to keep in mind, just keep an eye on your disk space as these uh, start to download because some of them, cache files, you know, can be large, especially VDBs and especially if you're using combustion, which we're not in this case, but just keep an eye because uh, potentially they'll stop downloading if you run out of disk space. Let's check one again. Yeah, it's looking really nice. So I could just do a little play blast of this while I'm waiting. Just go up to frame 50. Do I frame 50 on which one? Yep. Let's just play blast that. So this is play blasted in less than two minutes, just about to finish up the final file. So it's really cool to be able to check this stuff while everything's caching. I could cancel the cache if I liked and, and reset it up. It's not costing my machine anything. And so this one has got more inherent velocity than uh, wedge zero. You can see that's pushing out a lot further. And it's also raising higher as well i think just based on that temperature that i've got higher but it'd be cool to look at the other one shortly and see where we're at all of them 
So all caching is completed and we can see that we're downloading. The files are getting bigger, which is why they're taking longer to download. So I'm just gonna look through my cache now. See some of these files coming down at sort of 800 meg per file. So yeah, it's gonna take a little while to download. Let's just move this out of the way. So we're on wedge index zero. If I scrub to like frame 50, we can see that the uh, smoke dust comes out to around about here on my screen. And then if I go to wedge index one and rewind, and then go back to frame 50 for wedge index one, we'll be able to see that this smoke comes out even further still, and it's much more plumy here. Um, and then I'll just go to wedge two, which is the third set and I'll come back to frame 50. May take a little bit longer to load as there's a bit more going on here. Now we can see that that smoke comes right out to there. So there's, there's a, a big difference between all of these. And so for me now, it would just be to play blast these, look at them individually uh, once they've downloaded um, and work out you know the best uh, the best route forward for me. So here's another example that I cached out on the cloud. This was using a pyroclastic explosion that's actually available in the Bifrost browser. And if we just go into fire, there's the pyroclastic explosion. I made some changes to it. Um, but also while we're here, there is a wedging section where you can actually go and look at a preset wedging example set up already. But yeah, for this one, I just changed some expansion scale settings and that just gave me uh, larger explosions. So my expansion scale went from 0.08 to 0.6. Uh, and then when all of that cache came back, what I did was created a new Bifrost graph, brought in a read open VDB cache node, added time to that, and then just assigned the same standard volume material that I did with the rest of them. And then in the outliner, just grab each one of those and I could offset it just to uh, just to take a look and just see the differences between them. Uh, we can see that they just pull out a bit here. They get bigger as they go. And uh, I've got a video of that here. There's the different types of uh, explosion that happen. So this is a really powerful feature. It enables me to look at these explosions now and then decide, you know, how the expansion scale was working and I can then sort of go down a certain route uh, knowing that you know I haven't got to do this caching on my own machine it speeds up my workflow by you know a good percentage and it's just a, it's just a great feature so that's the technical preview of flow wedging it is in its infancy but at the moment it's highly efficient um, I've enjoyed using it simulating with it it's taking all of those really sort of resource intensive tasks away from my machine onto the cloud and it's enabled me to create more simulations much more quickly and efficiently so give it a go and happy wedging